I'm delighted to have George Bullard here this weekend. Uh, I want to give my voice a rest. I appreciate that. It's very timely there. But far more the message that George has to share with us. He's been here this weekend and he's told us very good things, things we need to hear and brought us some good challenges. Wasn't here to just soothe us in all things, but just set up a new road ahead, a new vision that we need to take. George has a message from God. I appreciate so much what he shared at the 830 service, and um, I had that experience. You know, you look at your watch like, over already? I, I, I want him to keep on going. You've got a good words here to share. Um, so please open up your hearts and minds, have good imagination, a good appreciation that George has good words to share from us for God's word about how God's people need to have a good vision, good faith, and a good openness to what God has to speak to us. So George, I'm excited to have you share with us once more. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today and to have the opportunity to have been with you all weekend. As Steve was talking about uh, his pop-up windows on his computer, I thought, well, you know, my mischievous self comes out. Now, Steve, if a window pops up that says reformat hard drive, click yes, okay? All right. Now, of course, that wipes everything out on your computer when that comes up, and so you hate it when that one comes up because it means you may have some serious trouble going on in terms of what's happening. Well, it, it is a delight to be with you. Um, it's great to be out in Phoenix. I think I probably have traveled to Phoenix about eight or ten times. I live in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, working with different clients and, and things like that. So it's always great to come back here. Uh, generally, when I have traveled in my ministry over the last uh, 38 years, some t uh, often when I'm traveling, I just go in, do my, my ministry, and then I leave. Uh, and so when I go back to a place later, then I get to do some, uh, with my wife, I get to do some sightseeing. But generally when we had children at home and then also just the issue of being away from home a lot, I would try to get straight back home. Well, this has been a little more relaxed weekend, and I had the opportunity last night to have dinner with my friends, uh, Mike and Lorraine Iyer. Uh, I've only seen Mike and Lorraine twice since the end of 1976. Mike was, our, was the music director of the church that I was pastor of in Louisville, Kentucky. And uh, then after they finished uh, seminary, because uh, we were both in seminary there, they moved out here to Phoenix for the role that he had, and they've been here ever since. I did see them in 1998, one other time when I was here, when I was actually working with their church. And so I was, I was able to enjoy some time in their home. So it was great to be with them last night and to renew old thoughts about a church known as West Side Baptist Church in the Portland community of Louisville, Kentucky, where we both served. And uh, to understand some of the things about that church that might relate to the whole concept of becoming a, a faith-soaring church, because that was indeed one of the journeys that that church was on. And so today we're going to talk about what it invo what's involved in, in becoming a faith-soaring church, but we're going to highlight particularly some of the experiences that we had at Westside Baptist Church. There are two short passages of Scripture for today. The first is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, uh, For we live by faith, not by sight. In other words, our, our journey is one of faith in God where we cannot really see all that's happening all the time. And so we have to live by faith that God has gone before us and, and has prepared the way for us. And then Isaiah chapter 40, 31, But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. And they will walk and not be faint. Well, let me tell you a little bit more about Westside uh, Baptist Church in terms of the kinds of things going on there. Uh, Westside was located in an upper lower class, lower middle class community. Uh, there, it was located about on 20th Street in the, the west end of Louisville. Uh, one block over, or 21st Street, one block over was 22nd Street, which was a north-south street that was the dividing line historically between the Irish Catholics that lived on the uh, east side of 22nd Street and, and the German Protestants who lived on the, the west side of 22nd Street. Way back in 19, I think it was 1926 actually, they had this big fight out in the middle of 22nd Street and about three or four people got killed. I mean, they really did not like one another. And it happened that uh, West Side was located just in the Irish Catholic area, but yet it was a, a, a Protestant church. At its height in around the mid-1950s, West Side Baptist Church had approximately 550 people in attendance. But in the early 70s, when, when uh, uh, about 1970 actually, when a pastor by the name of Bob Mulkey, 
uh, came there as pastor, they were down to about 50 to 60 in attendance. And uh, they had reached the end of their first life cycle as a congregation, their first 22 to 27 years, in about the mid-50s, reached the height of their attendance, and then they began down the aging side of the life cycle as a congregation, had a couple of bumps along the road that, that spurred them up a little bit, but basically kept a steady decline. Now that tends to happen to congregations where there's a, a strong, positive, spiritual, founding dream or vision that that congregation lives out for uh, up to 22 to 27 years, and then it has difficulty ever having a new dream or vision again unless it intentionally focuses on the next thing that God is trying to do in and through the congregation, unless it intentionally focuses on walking by faith rather than by sight. You know, when we walk by sight, we do the things we're familiar with, the things we know, and the things that we, we remember about great experiences in the church. When we walk by faith, we walk into new territory where only God truly knows where we're headed. But we have this strong trust in God for the next stage of our individual life, for the next stage uh, of, our, of our congregational life. When Bob Mulkey came as pastor in 1970, they only had 50 to 60. About a year after he had been there, the person who had served as chairman of the pastor search committee finally got the courage to tell him that they had nine candidates for pastor of that church. And he was the ninth one. The first eight told him they ought to just close. And he didn't say that, so they said, well, this is who God wants to be our pastor. He's not telling us to close. And Bob said, I didn't know enough to tell you to close <laughs> in, in terms of what was happening. It was Bob's first pastorate. He was a, a graduate student at the seminary, and he was called there in that role. Two years later, in 1972, through the, the, the facilities of a, a foundation grant in the community there, I was brought on half-time as the associate pastor for community ministries. And we were going to engage in uh, some new attempts to try to move forward in the life and ministry of the church. Now, from the time that Bob arrived there as pastor, uh, they were, he, he began to try to talk to them about vision, about the new thing that God is in the process of doing in their midst, potentially, about mounting up with wings like eagles and running and not getting tired and, and walking and not become weary, as Isaiah 40, 31 tells us. But it fell on deaf ears. Their basic response to Bob's message of vision casting was, huh? It didn't hit with them. They didn't get it. They didn't quite understand what was, what was going on. And that's because sometimes it takes a while for us to engage in preparation to hear and understand and respond positively to the new thing that God is in the process of doing in our midst. And, and I call that because uh, I've lived in South Carolina most of my life since 1985. Uh, I call that uh, in South Carolina culture talk that we're fixing to get ready to commence to begin to start to do something, maybe. You know, we, we, we got to have some fixing time you know, in terms, of, in terms of what's happening about it. And so um, what Bob then did was, and by the time I got there in 1972, he had shifted his rhetoric and his preaching and his teaching and in his leadership and his personal conversation from we got to do these things to live into God's vision for us to we got to do these things to survive. If we don't do this, we're going to die. Well, they got that. You know, that was pretty plain. And so they began responding to the things that he was talking about and responding to the things that he was suggesting. And so they brought me on as a staff person to kind of lead out in those new things that we needed to do in the community and, and to engage the community and get to know the people and to, to, to be a part of, of the, the unconditional, presence, uh, unconditional love presence of God in, in Christ Jesus in that community. One of the things that we were able to do in, in that first year that really was a, a wonderful kind of experience is that uh, even though our community had a, a broad cross-section of ages and stages of life, it, it did have more than its share, more than the typical community, not like Sun City, but more of the typical community of senior adult population. And so we were able to apply for and become the site of a federally funded senior adult hot lunch program. So every day, Monday to Friday, between 70 and 80 senior adults would either come by, by van or come by uh, that, that was provided for them or their own cars or they'd walk 
and have lunch at our church. And the food was catered in, and we had a local director there. And, and because it was a, an interesting uh, Title I uh, by the federal government, a local council of people could decide whatever they wanted to have as, as auxiliary programming. So the first thing they did was ask the pastor and I to lead a Bible study for them. So we were able to have true Christian-focused ministry with them at the same time because they asked for it, not because we told them we were going to do it. Well, it's always interesting the, we, you know, when people get together, senior adults get out of their houses when they're used to just staying in their houses most, most days, some relationships developed. In fact, in the next three or four years, we had two marriages and one living arrangement that came out of that, uh, that senior adult hot lunch program. Now, we won't talk about the living arrangement, but we'll talk about the, the, the first marriage was an 83-year-old man and a 72-year-old woman. The woman had been married before, but the Steve had never been married in the 83 years of his life. And uh, so their, their wedding ceremony was actually held in our church fellowship hall, and then they sat down at the lunch tables for their reception. It was so unique of those federally funded programs in Louisville and Jefferson County, Kentucky, that we had a newspaper reporter there and a, and a, and a television cameraman there. And so they were big news. And as he was telling his story, Steve said, well, the first date I invited Josie on was the midnight cruise on the Bell of Louisville boat on, on the, the Ohio River. So it, they had a really, really keen romantic story. But that was just an example of some of the many things that we were able to get going in that place. But it was all given permission by the church because they were motivated by survival. Now, in order to understand this story, I've now got to introduce you to what I think is below the surface, always felt like was a lovable teddy bear, but on the outside he was anything but. His name is Harry Niemeyer. Now, Harry Niemeyer, with the name Niemeyer, he was of German heritage, but somehow he got to live on the Irish Catholic side of the road, shall we say. And, uh, and Harry dug ditches uh, every day for the, the, the Louisville Gas Company, and uh, then at night and on the weekends, he was our church custodian, though he was often tired from digging ditches, and he'd pay cash to teenage boys to do most of the cleaning work for him, except deal with the, the, the equipment, and he wanted to deal with the electrical equipment. And um, then on Sundays, he was the chairman of our ushers, and then eventually he became a deacon in our church. And Irene, his wife, didn't work, but she, they only lived about a block and a half from our church, and it was a straight shot out her front door to see the side door of our church that most people came in and out of. So we always said that Harry and Irene could control what was going on in that church 24-7, you know, between all the activities that they had going on there. Well, Harry and Irene had, uh, had a couple of children and grandchildren, and uh, every Tuesday and Saturday nights, they would go to wrestling at the Coliseum. Now, you understand, that's different from wrestling. You know, there's wrestling, then there's wrestling. And this was way back before WWJ, now WWE, and, uh, and they would gather all their family at their house uh, right before they went to the Coliseum for, for wrestling, and uh, they would, uh, Irene would cook homemade soup or homemade chili, and two years later, in 1974, I became pastor of the church when Bob Mulkey left, and uh, they, uh, they would bring us chili or, or homemade soup by the church parsonage, uh, with, that was right next door to the church, and, and that would be our dinner on Tuesday night or, or Saturday night, uh, that kind of thing. So what I want you to understand about Harry is that Harry was, you know, he was kind of a gruff man. You know, he loved wrestling, he loved digging ditches, you know, he loved giving you a hard time about stuff. In fact, he was the kind of guy who would want to stop you in the church hallway when you had to be the other side of the church in two minutes leading a meeting and engage you in a 30-minute conversation. Is there anybody in this church like, well, no, you don't need to tell me. But uh, that's, that's, that was Harry. But Harry was, you know, what's in front of my face is what I want to deal with. And so if you're in front of his face, he wants to deal with you. Well, when we were starting all these new community ministries and trying to reach out and get our church re-in touch with its community context, um, I suggested to the pastor that we ought to have a committee or team of people that uh, we could check everything out with before we just did it and, uh, and be sure that it was going to be all right and, be, and get their guidance and their prayer support, et cetera, et cetera. And in putting together that group, I recommended that Harry serve on that team. And he said, you're crazy. I said, no, I want Harry in the room where I can watch him. So if I can get it through Harry, the rest of the church is a breeze. 
And so we had our, we formed the committee team, we had the first meeting, and I was walking through the church fellowship hall on the way to the sanctuary upstairs to lead the youth choir practice, and I could already, already hear the youth running around up there, and I needed to get up there, and Harry said, Brother George, I got to talk to you a minute. Well, Harry, I need to be upstairs. Well, this won't take but a minute. I need to tell you, Brother George, I don't want to be a part of that committee no more. I said, you don't want to be a what? We just had one meeting. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure I like the kind of stuff that you and Brother Bob are doing. It's causing more work for me and my boys to clean up and all this kind of stuff. I don't really think that's going to help us survive. Well, I was 23 years old then, and I hadn't quite gained the maturity that I hope I've now gained, and my reptilian brain would kick in fairly quickly. So my reptilian brain kicked in, and I started letting Harry have it verbally. And, and uh, I, I just kept saying, Harry, it's people like you are going to kill the church. You know, we got to do these kinds of things, yada, yada, yada. And he'd keep backing up about a half a step and smiling broader. That really confused me. Why is he smiling so much? And finally said, all right, all right, all right. I'll stay on that committee, but I'm not going to let that woman talk to me like this. Ah, I realized what he was talking about. In that first meeting, Harry was sitting next to a woman named Floor Watkins. And Harry said something that was really funny. Everybody laughed. Floor Watkins slapped him on his knee and said, Harry, that's so funny, that's just like my husband. Well, her husband was an alcoholic, and Harry was not going to be called a drunk by that woman. <laughs> well, things went on, and things began to do well. And uh, uh, Bob Mulkey finished his graduate work at the seminary, was actually called to a church as pastor in Columbia, South Carolina, where I now live. And I, I was called as pastor of the church and, and was there. And I hadn't been pastor of the church long when we had one of these hall encounters, Harry and myself. And, and Harry stopped me when I had to be somewhere else, the other side of the building. And he said, Brother George, can I talk to you? You and Brother Bob both lied to this church. And I think we ought to call Brother Bob back and both of you all to stand up in front of this church and ask us to forgive you. I said, Harry, what did we do? What are you talking about? He said, well, it's this business about surviving. You've been telling us that we're doing all of these community ministry kinds of things and having all these people in and out of our buildings in order to survive, and that's a lie. We're doing all this because that's what the, what the love of Jesus would have us do, right? Well, Harry was the first layperson in that church through that gruff exterior who realized that we were doing the things we were doing in response to the leadership of God and to move forward in the next direction, of where, in the next phase of life where God was leading us. It didn't matter how many times Bob Mulkey preached and teached and led and talked about vision or myself. It can't be just the pastor alone. It was not until the people of the congregation, those sitting in the pews, Sunday after Sunday, were captivated by God's new vision for the congregation that we were indeed able to move forward. When Harry made that declaration, I began preaching and teaching once again about vision. It was like when you line up a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand dominoes and you click the first one and they all fall down. Vision spread like wildfire throughout the congregation. And we grew 20 to 25% in numbers over the next two years and in vitality and in financial support and in connection with our neighborhood. But it was because we got to the place after we had done some fixing to get ready to commence to begin to start to do something maybe where we soared with faith. Faith soaring churches are like this. Faith-soaring churches are congregations who effectively soar with faith to achieve exceptional ministry. They are congregations who boldly and effectively soar with faith into a future known only by God, where they've never been before, and what they cannot see at the beginning of their journey. Faith-soaring churches are congregations who effectively soar with faith beyond ordinary ministry toward extraordinary ministry in a quest to achieve exceptional ministry. They respond to the pulling of God. They journey to places of inspiration, imagination, and innovation. They, they progress through processes of missional formation and engagement, and they continually transform their capacity to reach their full kingdom potential. 
The basic issue is there are four different things going on in the life of most churches, and they are characterized by the words vision, relationships, programs, and management. Vision is our current understanding of God's spiritual and strategic direction for us as a congregation. Where is God leading us? God is seeking to impart vision to the body, the church. But God is not imparting vision through the pastor to the church. An example being Westside, but I've seen it in hundreds of churches in the last 38 years. God is imparting vision to the body, the church. We hope that the senior pastor is among the first, if not the very first, to be captivated by that vision, as was the case with Bob Mulkey, because the pastor has a key role in being the voice of vision to the congregation. But we all must be captivated by it. We can't call a pastor, stand a pastor up, and say, okay, do your tricks. You know, make us go forward. It's all of our journey under God. The second thing is relationships. Relationships are about our relationship to God, to one another in congregation, and to that community context in which we serve. It is how we are the presence of God, uh, how we represent and how we act upon the unconditional love of God through Jesus Christ. Programs are the programs, ministries, and activities of the church, the visible things that we see and do on a week-in, week-out basis. Management is basically the governance of the church how we deal with the four Bs, bodies, bucks, boards, and buildings. <laughs> well, I want you to think about these four factors, vision, relationship, programs, and management, and how we align them in the church in this manner. And when I, I, I think about images, I like to think about really good quality images. And so let's think about a Lexus sports utility vehicle. And let us suppose that vision, relationship, programs, and management are the four passengers in a Lexus sports utility vehicle that is a, a, a metaphor for the church, the local congregation. The question then is, who is seated where and why? And the answer is that vision is driving and fueling the forward progress of the vehicle. Relationships are navigating and flavoring the style of the journey. Programs are in the back seat behind relationships, providing the programmatic infrastructure through which the best possible relationships with God, one another, and the community context can occur. And management's in the back seat behind, behind vision, pro providing the, the administrative infrastructure that frees vision up to soar like the wind. But because a church is, is organic, it's an organism rather than an organization, the, the, the four passengers, vision, relationship, programs, and management, need a rest every once in a while. So what happens when vision needs a rest? It needs to say, I need to take a nap in the back seat for a while as we continue this journey. Who drives? Well, let's go to Scripture. Proverbs 29, 18, the first half of the verse says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Or another translation, Where there is no vision, the people cast off all restraint. Or colloquially, where there is no vision, the people run around in circles without any clear sense of focus or direction. Or where there is no vision, and Moses the leader stays too long on the mountain in communion with God, then the people clam clamor that Aaron the manager build them an image of God that they can see and touch. Where there is no vision, management drives. And while management driving is intended to be a respite and tends to happen when a congregation is no longer really sure what's the vision that, that we're living into, where is God pulling us? When management gets behind the steering wheel, it kind of becomes, squeezes the steering wheel and says, I'm finally in my rightful place. And because management doesn't understand all this touchy-feely stuff of relationship over here on its right, it, it, uh, it, it keeps looking over its shoulder at programs in the back seat until eventually it says, the, the relationship says, hey, I want to take a nap too. And so they pull over to the side, relationships pulls in the, gets in the back, and programs gets in the front. And management and programs, folks, are walking by sight, whereas vision and relationships are walking by faith. And so what has happened is the church that was faith-soaring 
has become a church that is more organizational, run by management and programs, than it is faith soaring in nature as an organism, a living, breathing, moving, dynamic, dynamic ever-changing organism, being led in unique ways daily by God. Well, that's the key role. That's the key thing on which we need to focus, is where, how do we, as Sun City Christian Church, that you know, was started in the mid-70s, lived out its first generation, maybe has tried a fix or, or two or three or whatever since then. But what's God's vision for you next? What's around the corner, over the next hill that you can't see yet? What's beyond the current horizon for you? For there's not a sunset in your future. There are only new horizons. When I went uh, on the staff of the South Carolina Baptist Convention in uh, 1985, my, my boss was a, a man by the name of Ray Rust. Love Ray Rust. He and his wife are in their late 80s now. They live in, in Dallas, Texas, retired. And, but Ray Rust was about the age I am now. I'm 63, and I was 34 at that time. And uh, whenever I'd get in the car to ride somewhere with him, when he would back out of a parking place, he would back out just enough to be able to turn the steering wheel and, and, and get going. Because, and I asked him one time why, and he says, well, I just have had some bad experiences backing up too far. Any of y'all ever had that? <laughs> and, uh, and so um, I didn't understand what he meant, because as a 34-year-old, you know, I was still kind of reckless about my driving and, and overconfident in terms of stuff like that. Now that I'm 63, I do the same thing. Any of y'all want to testify to that, to, to what you do? But, uh, but the thing that is the symbol there that is so important, in order to be a faith-soaring church, you don't do much backing up, if any. In fact, back, if you recall, is a four-letter word. And we even try not to use that four-letter word in the church, that we're going back to the way things were. We're always putting it in drive, and with, the, with vision as the driver, as led by God, moving forward to the next things that God is in the process of doing in our midst. Sun City Christian Church, what is the next thing that God is in the process of doing in your life as a congregation and as an individual? Are you fixing to get ready to commence to begin to start to do something? Are you already started with it? Are you soaring with faith? Are you mounting up with wings as eagles and, and, and moving forward in terms of where God is leading you? That is my prayer. Amen.